we're delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is a professor of archaeology at Bournemouth University. He's been involved in some major digs at Stonehenge and many other sites, including some very interesting work that we were following many years ago on the Bluestone site in the Priscelli area of Wales. But his main focus and what we're going to focus on this weekend is not only Stonehenge, but this remarkable project called the Human Henge Project, which is going to get into today, the therapeutic nature of these ancient sites. So please give a warm megalithomania welcome to Professor Timothy Darville. Thank you very much indeed for inviting me to come and talk to you today. It's very kind of you, Hugh, and, and to have been watching some of the things that we've been doing over the last few years. As you say, I'm going to be here twice. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, but talking about two completely different things, although Stonehenge does slightly feature a little bit in both of them. What I'm going to do today is to talk about this project, the Human Henge, but I'd like to start by introducing some of the thinking that went on behind it, how we got to the point where we even started a project, which was thinking about how we can use therapeutic landscapes and archaeological sites to help people with mental health problems. And we'll talk through a little bit of the background of that, and then I'm going to unfold something of Human Henge for you as well. So let's just start with a picture. A picture, which as you can see, is from the early years of the 19th century, 1834. It's part of a series of pictures by Thomas Cole of the rise of the human being. It starts with absolute chaos. It goes through this second phase, which is the pastoral or Arcadian state, and then goes on to the decline of the human race into more modern times. This, in a sense, was the apogee of life for Thomas Cole. This was the place in the history of the human existence when things were fine. And as you've been looking at that picture, perhaps as I've been talking, you'll notice one or two interesting things. One of which is that Stonehenge is there pretty much in the middle. Have you spotted that? Just there. It's got some smoke coming out of it, which is quite interesting in itself, and it makes you wonder uh, what's going on here. You can see sheep grazing, you can see some shepherds, you can see some uh, lakes. It is indeed an Arcadian or pastoral state of existence, I think one would have to agree. Those who know the picture will perhaps also know that it's not in Britain. It's in fact in the Mississippi Valley of North America. And uh, you can find this landscape beside the river uh, still today. He's used it as a model and he's popped into it Stonehenge. Now this tells us two things, and the reason I just start thinking about what we're going to talk about today with a picture like this is that the first thing is that Cole has used something of the past, Stonehenge in this case, to create an image. It's an iconic image, but it's there to help us think our way into what he wants to talk about through his art. And the second thing is that he's undertaken, if you like, an analysis of the human condition. And he's come up with an understanding, we may not agree with it, but he's come up with an understanding of how the human condition changes over time. And his series of pictures, in a sense, helps us through that set of thinking, that set of understandings. And I use this picture because to get to human henge, there's two dimensions of thinking that has come together. The first which we're going to mention is the idea of making monuments work for us. And the second, which we'll come to in a few minutes, is how we understand some of those monuments. Well, we all know places like Stonehenge, Avebury, all the other sites, megalithic sites are high on the list, but there's lots of other archaeological sites as well, of course. And we tend to look at them as sites. But they're much more than that. There's something that we can use today. And in a strange sort of sense, perhaps, to spend money maintaining them, to keep them, to look after them, we need to make them work for us. They've got to do something in return 
for all the effort that we put into it. It reminded me, when I was thinking about this, of um, a small quote from the very famous composer Gustav Mahler back in the 19th century. Tradition, he says, is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire. And I think when we come to think about archaeological sites, we should substitute tradition for conservation, preservation, heritage, any of those kind of words. It's not worshipping ashes. It's a preservation of fire. And it's the fire that we want out of those monuments. And we know, of course, that uh, places like Stonehenge get regularly used. Um, many of you, I suspect everybody in this audience has been to Stonehenge at the solstice at some time or another. It's something we do. It's a great event. And when it's on the weekend, of course, a lot of people go there. And if you're lucky, June 2018 was one such year. You can see the sunrise beautifully on the summer solstice. Fantastic. But as we also know, Stonehenge is used for so many more things these days. Um, art is, is very much part of it, but also music. Um, Paul Oakenfold's performance there in uh, 2018 was just the latest of a whole series of events which went on there. And um, some of you may even have picked up the um, CD, Sunset at Stonehenge, which has got some uh, interesting selection of, of music on it as well. There's lots of things that we could say about these monuments, and in fact we could have a whole talk about the use of these monuments, but I'll just pick up one or two just to highlight some of the more theatrical side of things, perhaps some of the more interesting performance-based side of things. Here's a nice aerial photograph of Avebury. Pretty straightforward, isn't it? Anything strange? There's another circle. That one doesn't actually exist. Until you zoom in and you realise it's not a circle at all, it's actually all the school children from the local schools making a circle in Avebury and enjoying the process of finding out how you make a circle. You don't actually need a megalithic yard or anything like that, you just joggle into position. Lots of people have worked out how to do that in the past. Um, this is how you quickly make a circle with a group of people. And as you can see, it's quite a regular, regular shape. Avebury, like Stonehenge, has lots of other ceremonies and festivals going on there. Um, it's hard to visit in the summer without uh, seeing some dancing group coming along to have a look. And, of course, at the solstices, things happen there just like they happen at Stonehenge, perhaps even in a more systematic way. I don't know whether anybody in that line is here today, um, but these are things which go on there. They're quite informal. They happen when they happen, with whom they happen. But some of this is a little bit more choreographed. Um, perhaps some of you have come across this company, Red Earth, who specialise in performance art at archaeological sites. And they do some incredible work whereby the audience becomes part of the work. And you are, as it were, an element in the unfolding of the, of the work, which often takes place over the course of a whole day, sometimes even, even a period of time, spanning a month in one case, I think. Um, and they dance their way into the monument. They construct things. They use sand. They use fire. They use smell. They use all sorts of sensory perceptions to help us work our way into these kind of monuments and think about them in wholly different ways. And this kind of opening up of how we think about place, how we think about monuments, is the first dimension that I like to just highlight as a, as a background to human henge. It asks this question, can we use monuments? It answers it, yes, we can, and we can do it in all sorts of different ways. And it's not confined to archaeological practice or indeed to any other disciplinary practice. It's open and inclusive, and we can share it, and that's important. So that's the first strand. The second strand which got me thinking, um, Hugh alluded to in his introduction, in fact, which is the idea that we have to understand monuments. We've got to come to some understanding of them. And again, that's something which can actually be very fluid, can be open, can be very participatory, can be co-productive. There's no one hegemonic view of what these things are. They are places where we can explore our understandings through what we can see, what we can observe, what we can understand. Many of you will know that my perspective on Stonehenge is that it most certainly isn't a place for the dead, that it's actually a place for the living. And no dead people built stone circles, as far as I'm aware. They had to be alive when they did that. Um, you have to be alive to use it. 
And Stonehenge is, in my view, a place for the living. And as we've heard uh, in his little introduction there, uh, a line of thought which uh, I've been pursuing for some years is that the bluestone elements of Stonehenge have a special magical power, and that magical power is connected with healing, just as was told to us by Geoffrey of Monmouth and, and various other potential sources of folklore and tradition that, that go way back. And we need to feed that into our thinking about understanding monuments. Indeed, it's in a sense such a fundamental aspect of Stonehenge, such a fundamental aspect of many kinds of monuments, that one wonders why we haven't used the notion of healing much more widely in our interpretation and understanding of all sorts of prehistoric monuments. After all, it is probably one of the most basic, one of the most shared human emotions that there is. To be well, in a general sense, is something which is incredibly important to all of us. And indeed, that our loved ones should be well as well. So this is part, part of life. And therefore, we have, to, we have to construct these narratives around these sorts of ways of thinking. When we were working at Stonehenge back in 2008, we opened up a very small trench to have a look at some of the um, uh, part of the, we'll have to have a look at part of the site which um, contained the bluestones in the middle and later phases of the monument. And uh, you can see the trench over here, and it's here on the ground. That's the trench there, and that's the spoil heap just beyond it. It's a very small cutting. It's a keyhole, literally a keyhole into Stonehenge. Um, we took away nearly four cubic metres of samples, and we've been working on those ever since. And, and I'm told from those who are working on it at the moment that the end is in sight in July, that we will finally have gone through every single grain of those samples, and we've extracted some extraordinary stuff, I can tell you, and over the next few months after that, we shall be working back through it, and I hope we'll have a lot more to say about Stonehenge in due course. But in thinking about that healing hypothesis for Stonehenge, an important part of our excavation was to involve communities who shared those kinds of understandings and interests in the site. And so we had an opening ceremony before we started the trench. Uh, this is what you see in progress on the screen there. And we had a closing ceremony when we sealed the trench up as well. And we asked the people of Stonehenge, we asked the stones of Stonehenge, to help us with our understanding of the monument. And that may, well, I suspect to you, it doesn't seem a strange thing at all, but to most archaeologists, it seems an extremely strange thing to do. But it bears upon a really interesting approach. And that approach is what we might loosely call a bottom-up approach. A bottom-up approach involves listening to the archaeological material that you're looking at. It's the exact opposite of coming in with a grand theory and saying, I'm going to prove this. There's no theory. You'll never prove anything. But what we can do is listen to the data. And listening to what we have there is just hugely important. And as an example, a couple of sites which help us with this listening in relation to healing. Lots of monuments and things around the world are very famous, and we tend to see them for what they are. But as soon as we just go a little bit below the surface, we realize that we can listen to it and we see some other things. So here's just an example, um, Delphi in Greece an ancient centre of an oracle, of course, the most important healing centre in the ancient classical world. It's a great temple to Apollo and all sorts of other things too, and archaeologists and others can describe it ad nauseum. Architectural historians use it all the time. But what really counts is what the people did there back in ancient times. And what they did there was all about healing and predicting the future. This is the business of Delphi. And when we look around at other sites, we see much the same sort of thing too. Um, in the Islamic world, for example, one of the absolutely central foci of what people do is to go on the Hajj. And Muhammad, of course, encouraged every follower to do the Hajj at least once in their lifetime. And many who, who follow Islam do that exactly. It's a very complicated business. It's basically a prehistoric ritual that Muhammad came across and suggested that his followers followed suit. 
It involves going out into the desert. It involves collecting stones. It involves pairs of megaliths which you throw the stones at. It involves a sacred well. It involves the Kaaba in the middle, which has got a piece of meteoric iron embedded into the wall. It involves making circular dances or movements around that central Kabbalah. This is the sort of prehistoric ceremony and ritual that we probably would have seen going on at Stonehenge had we put ourselves back, let's say, to 2000 or so BC. These are the sorts of things. They help us illuminate these things. The Hajj isn't about the journey necessarily. It's about the actions and the activities which go on there. And again, it's all about healing. It's all about ritual, cleansing, thinking about the future, all these kind of things going on. Um, we can mention a couple of others. For example, um, here we see the, the great cabal in the center and we see some of the rituals going on here with the Hajj. Really important, really important ritual. Um, and in the Christian world, we can see it too. Santiago de Compostela is probably one of the most famous healing sites in the whole of Europe. And people walk, I don't know, hands up anybody who's walked from Britain to Santiago, fantastic. That's probably the greatest number I've seen in, in an audience where I've done this lecture to before. And it's an incredible experience. I must say I've never done it, but I've done a little bit of it. And it's an incredible experience, would you say? Yeah, yeah. Um, this is how healing works and you know the only reason that people walk and do that pilgrimage is to go to that magnificent church and to find the finger bone of St James apparently it's probably in fact a bone from a megalithic grave but let's not worry about that too much at the moment um, and to participate in those rituals and being there at the right time being there as part of that ritual is, is all part of what goes on here. So another great cathedral, the underlying purpose of which in terms of its international renown is all about healing. Fantastic site. Um, but we can, you know, these are big scale things internationally known, but you know, let's just remember some of the local stuff as well. Pretty much every parish in, in Britain and probably in Northwest Europe has got its holy well, its sacred well, its magic spring, sacred spring, whatever you want to call it. They've all got different sorts of names. Many of them have got these lovely little stone houses built over the top. I guess many of us here have been to the Swallowhead Springs at uh, Avebury at different times, perhaps left a gift, perhaps ties something to the tree. It's a continuing and ongoing tradition, but why do we do it? We do it because it's a healing ritual. We do it because it's a response to the world around us. We do it because it brings us closer to nature. All these kind of arguments are brought into play when we think about this sort of stuff. And actually, it's nothing new. I'm not saying anything new here um, from an archaeological point of view particularly. Uh, folks back in the 19th century knew exactly about these kind of issues, and indeed, hospital designs, if you go back through the sort of architectural literature, the design of hospitals, especially hospitals to deal with mental health patients or asylums as they would have been called back then of course, were designed and constructed in a way which introduced people to their landscape and created a healing environment in which people's wellness was the number one priority. So here's an example on the screen, for example, from Brislington House in Bristol. It was opened in 1806. That's a good old time ago now. Um, the grounds were laid out by Edward Long, and they were landscaped in order to make patients feel at home. To feel at home in an asylum, that's quite an interesting concept to be putting forward. They were, in a sense, already starting to do what these days we would call social prescribing. They were creating the spaces in which people could find themselves and maybe mitigate some of the difficulties that they were having. And this whole area has become quite an important area of academic research in more recent times. Um, this gentleman that you see on the screen now, Will Gessler, is probably the leader of this field, or at least was the founder of this field, and an area of studies which are known as therapeutic landscapes. Landscapes whether large or small, built upon these healing dimensions of specific sites or the activities which are undertaken there or the connections between place and well-being and how the process of healing, how the process that you go through of healing works itself out through people's subjective experiences 
of their surroundings. And this relationship between people and their surroundings is an important dimension of healing, which we can see in the archaeological picture, we can see from the medical work of the 19th century and later, and we see in the work of, of Gessler and his cronies coming through this, this idea of healing places. And you see some of his books there on the right-hand side. And if you look very carefully at the one at the bottom, you'll notice that Bath, of course, is the place on the cover, and I could have included Bath on my little roundup of sites just now. The whole reason for there being a Roman temple and all the other things at Bath is as a hailing place, a place of healing and well-being. So this is very strong uh, in the academic literature. Um, it's been carried on um, by a number of other scholars. We see a couple of books here. And what they've become very interested in, in a sense, is how the landscape is experienced so that it becomes much more than a passive entity. It becomes something which is restorative, which has healing impact on people's actual lives. And of course, what this is doing is moving away from a biomedical approach to a much more, in academic terms, socio-ecological approach. But what we're talking about here is social prescribing in a general sense. It's about the reconnection, if you like, and if you kind of draw through this literature, there's two dimensions which come to the fore. The first is the notion of a journey or making a journey. It's actually there in the pilgrimage sites, it's there in the Hajj, it's there in Santiago and so on. It doesn't have to be big journeys, but journeys are an important part of what's going on here. Journeys which are, in a sense, a means to an end. And the second theme which comes across very strongly is the idea of bridges things which connect people with themselves, people with their surroundings, people with their environment, people with other people, anything that you can, in a sense, conceive of as a connection, the bridge is what you need in order to make that connection work. And things such as dance and song and music and place and perhaps things like stone or nature, trees, animals, birds, all these sorts of things, are part of the process of bridging the gap between the person and the world around about. And so that dynamic of having bridges linking us to other things is really important, and it's part of a journey. And you could say, you know, if you really want to force the metaphor a bit, you know, the journey includes bridges along the way to get you through the process. I won't go push it any further than that, but you'll see that it's, it's an important part of this debate. Well, this is the academic debate which has been going on, but alongside it is a really interesting emergent political debate. Because in a way, if we're going to move towards things like social prescribing and any other approach, we've got to do it within the context of political philosophy and political thinking that's going on at the moment. So at a global scale, we've got these so-called development goals, sustainable development goals. There's 17 of them which have been set out by the United Nations and which have been agreed by just about every country that is a member of the United Nations and they're operationalized through the subcommittees of the United Nations which in the case of heritage is, is of course UNESCO. United Nations has lots of these subcommittees and they're there to implement these things. I don't know whether you can read the little boxes from, from back where you are, just, just read out uh, one or two of them. We've got here no poverty, for example. Uh, number three is the one that's of interest to us, good health and well-being. Um, we've got things down here like climate action, of course, uh, life underwater, life on land. We can go through all these things, but have a look at them because they're quite interesting. They're interesting because, effectively, every government that signed up to these has got to do something about it, and the rest of the world is watching them. They may not do much, and you know, I suspect many of us are a little bit sceptical of politics at the moment, but nonetheless, they are the themes which are supposed to be explored. And you see these things cascading down in policy. In a way, a discipline like archaeology has got to address these themes to make our work relevant, to make our work contemporary, to make our work of interest and to justify the public funding that goes into it, these are the sorts of areas that we need to be looking at. And in fact, as you read through them, they're pretty sensible areas, in fact. 
At a lower level, we can find other important uh, political dimensions here. Um, the Council for Europe, for example, has a framework convention on the value of cultural heritage for society. Um, Council of Europe is not to be confused with the European Union. It's a completely different organization, and we are still members of the Council of Europe. Um, it happens to be based in Strasbourg. I'm sure some of you know the complexity of it. The European Union meet in the council chamber of the Council of Europe, whereas the European Union, of course, is based in Brussels. But the Strasbourg bit is not the European Union, Strasbourg is actually the Council of Europe. And that uh, is a really important uh, group. It's much bigger than the European Union, and it's they that have responsibility for culture and heritage. And they take those responsibilities incredibly seriously. And we have this convention framework, which is what situates and frames, again, government action in relation to these things. And the basic idea is that conservation of the cultural heritage and its sustainable use have human development and quality of life as their goal. Those are the goals which are asked of governments when they're funding work on heritage and archaeology to achieve. Not a greater understanding of Stonehenge, but a contribution to the quality of life of our citizens. And there's a subtle and important difference there. The European Union has said some things about this as well. There's a European Pact for Mental Health and Wellbeing, which advocates, for example, the active inclusion of people with mental health problems in the community. There's a directive, which is long before Brexit came along, telling us that we've got to get this drilled down to community kind of level. And within the UK, we've got the uh, Department of Culture, Media and Sport, now 2014, publishing a very important paper about quantifying and valuing the well-being impacts of culture and sport. So they're supporting this kind of idea as well, and, and we've seen money coming through from there. And in 2016, the Cultural White Paper contained a commitment to develop and promote the contribution of the cultural sectors to improving health and well-being. I think you can start to see how these kind of international ideas, really important ideas, trickle down into specific domestic legislation and guidance that's what we have to work with on a day-to-day -day kind of basis. So it's there. It's been there for a little while, about a decade or so in, in round numbers, and we're starting to understand it more and explore it more. And an important part of what a lot of heritage work has been doing in recent years is trying to explore some of these themes. And the happy news is that actually there's a good number of projects which have gone on which involve heritage and the broader question of well-being. Some of them are based around museums, some of them are based in hospitals, some of them are based in uh, other places where it's actually quite difficult to get access to. For example, in Bournemouth we've been doing some work with prisoners Prisoners can't go to museums, and yet lots of prisoners are quite interested in what museums have got. The obvious solution is to take the museum to the prison, which is what we've done. You package up bits of museum and you take it to the museum, you take it to the prison. The same with old folks' homes. They can't come to the museum, so let's take the museum to them. There's all sorts of ways that we can do this, and there's, if you like, the, the environment, the support, for doing these kind of things. So that's, that's one approach that's been quite successful. And there's, there's a series of projects there on the screen. There's lots more we could mention. Um, some of them involve archaeology a little bit more directly, um, actual excavation and survey and some of the things that we would regard as archaeological technique. Probably the most well known is the uh, Operation Nightingale, which is, of course, to help uh, former soldiers, former military people who have um, come out of the military, often with some sort of post um, some sort of stress disorder as a result of, of the things that they've seen or been through whilst they've been in the military and they get involved in excavating sites and this turns out is quite a helpful way of bringing them back into the community and reintegrating them and, and helping them with some of the difficult issues that they go through. We, uh, the team of us in, in Bournemouth that are working on this, brought together um, an overview of some of this in a, in a book which was um, the Handbook of Wellbeing, which was published by Routledge. This is almost all uh, medical and, um, and uh, social prescribing from a very much health perspective, but we were asked to contribute uh, a chapter on it, and uh, the team put this together looking at heritage and well-being. And it was a nice way of just, just um, you know, clearing the ground a bit and showing what was going on at that time. But that's what prompted us to start thinking about other approaches. And that's when those combinations of how do we use monuments 
and how do we understand monuments came together, fused together, if you like, in an idea which we developed called the human hedge. That's where um, we're going to go for a few minutes now. It's a project which is all about archaeology and mental health and creativity. And that last word is incredibly important, creativity. Archaeology is itself an incredibly creative process. We are creating a vision of the past in what we do. Well, we started the project back in uh, 2016, October 2016. It's now run its course, and I'm going to show you the results of, of what goes on. It is, of course, a partnership. It's not something that you can do on your own, this kind of thing. It's very much a partnership. It was led by the Restoration Trust, which is an organization, a charity, which is dedicated to looking after people with, with mental health issues. Um, ourselves at Bournemouth University, the Richmond Fellowship in, in Wiltshire, which is, um, again, it's a charity which looks after its direct help line for people with mental health issues. English Heritage and the National Trust were both very much on board with this and, and this is a hugely important contribution to their research on it. We couldn't do it though without the help of the healthcare people and the Avon and Wiltshire Mental Health Partnership, which is an NHS trust, were very much involved in this too and indeed it was them who selected the participants for our project. We didn't choose them, they were referred to us through, this, um, through the National Health Service system and Wiltshire County Council and Amesbury Council were very much part of it as well. The really nice thing is that this was funded not from some academic uh, funding body, but from the Heritage Lottery Fund. It's one of the first times that they've funded research into this kind of area, and I think they found it, I know they found it quite uh, gratifying that they could work with us in this kind of way to, to spend some money to just find out what's possible, find out what can be done, and, and that's, that's really good news. They were, of course, and let's be frank about it, they were responding to some of those political interventions which we mentioned just now which were requiring organizations in Britain to work within these various framework documents. Lesson of the story, check the framework documents and see where you can get the money. Before we go on though I just want to explore one, one little avenue and some of this might be familiar to some of you. Mental health is a very difficult issue. It's a very widespread issue. It's estimated that one in four people in the population have mental health issues during the course of their lives. That's, that's quite a serious number. Um, but not everybody's the same, of course. There are many, many different kinds of mental health issue. And you might say that everybody's on the gradient somewhere. Some are a bit more extreme than others, and some have greater difficulties than others, but nonetheless, we're all there somewhere in the picture. So we need some sort of overarching way of thinking about this, which helps us structure and develop these kind of social prescribing systems or programs. And the model which we've used, and I have to preface this by saying it's incredibly simplistic and it's very generalizing, but the model that we use, perhaps it's familiar to some of you, is that of being in a dark corridor. Being in a dark corridor that doesn't seem to be leading anywhere. Indeed, it's frightening and it's scary to be in there. So much so that you can't necessarily go out your house because you're bounded inside this area of darkness. And our job in this model, and I emphasize that it's a very simplistic model of mental health, but our job in this is in a way to punch some doors and windows into that blackness, to let some light in, to let people see where they are, to see that room, to see that bigger picture. And as I say, it's very simplistic, but you'll see perhaps where we're going with the project with that sort of simplistic model in mind. There's more that can be done, but that's, that's the starting point perhaps for where we are. So Human Henge was all about trying to understand things, the world, yourself, all sorts of things, not just archaeology by any means, but to understand through engagement through being with something, being in something, being part of something, being involved. It's an engagement which is active. It's not passive. It's not about reading books and so on. It's about being there, being in the place, being part of an operation. Therefore, it's very physical. It has physical activity involved with it and relaxation, particularly relaxation out of the world in which we find ourselves, is also an incredibly important part of what we do. And just as I use that Thomas Cole picture at the beginning, just to kind of relax us down into thinking about some of this, an important part 
of these kind of programs is to take people out of the world and to transform them, translate them, whatever sort of word you want to use, into the place where we want to work, into the place where we want to do some things. So that's an important part. Equally, it's the idea that we need to gain social support and create interactions. And social support and interaction is, is a very important dimension of, of breaking out of some of these darknesses. To improve concentration and to create a non-threatening environment. The worst possible situation for anybody suffering mental health uh, difficulties is to be in a threatening environment. And of course, their perception of what's threatening may be different from ours. So we have to kind of work around, around that. To create some sort of emotional stability, to think through different perspectives. That's an important strand in this work. And I would emphasize that second part, to think through different perspectives. Because if we can use those things, we can often create a little bit of headroom within that darkness to do things nicely. Therapeutic sensory experiences using all the senses, that's obvious. But I think heritage and archaeology bring to the game one thing which most other kind of areas of thought in this line don't. You can do gardening, you can go for a walk and go for a bike ride and all sorts of other things, and they were told they have therapeutic value, and I don't dispute it. But they only use the normal senses. I think what archaeology brings to the game is that we can also use imagination. We can use imagination to break people out of the world that they're in, to imagine themselves in a different place, in a different world, in a different situation. And that role of imagination as something which is incredibly powerful is something which can be triggered by being at a prehistoric site or an archaeological site of some kind. And we may not know the answer, but we do know that it's different from our world, different from our life. And we can imagine, you can imagine, anybody can imagine themselves in that place. They don't have to be right. We only have to use the stimuli of imagination to help us get our mind working, get our mind thinking. Well, we use those kind of ideas to put together a program, a program of, of basically 10 weeks of activities, uh, one day a week. Um, and we used Stonehenge and Avebury as the place where we ran these venues. Not actually at Stonehenge, although we did visit Stonehenge itself, but very much the Stonehenge landscape, the Cursus, the Barrow Cemeteries, the Cuckoo Stone, Durrington Walls, Woodhenge, all these other places around about that you know. And essentially each day was spent at one of these venues. Now, I found this incredibly therapeutic myself, actually, because I've been so used over the last 20 years or so of running people around the landscape as quickly as you can to show them as much as you can and just kind of stand there and say, oh, that was built in this and that was that and so on. To spend a day standing on a barrow, thinking about that barrow with 20 or 30 other people and using that barrow as a means of exploring other worlds was actually incredibly informative. And I I've, I've, must admit, from an archaeologic, purely archaeological point of view, I've thought about barrows and some of the other sites in very different ways as well, having done that. So it was actually quite a, <clears throat> a nice thing to just stop and, and you know, take stock and, and go, go back to it. So there's some of the sites around um, Stonehenge. <clears throat> Avebury, the same. You can see some of the sites we visited there numbered. And you'll notice both at Stonehenge and Avebury, it culminates in a ceremony at the Henge, which was developed <coughs> and performed and run by the participants. Not us, by the participants. We just facilitated the process. Um, facilitation was important. Uh, the lady you see at the top there, Yvette Stalens, was the main facilitator for all of these programs. She had a supporting cast of musicians and, and experts and all sorts of people that she brought in to help with the delivery of these sessions. Um, there were three groups, as I say, each was about a dozen people. We had some extra helpers on those, all of whom had mental health first aid training and so on uh, as part of it. The groups were referred to us from the NHS National Health Service um, and, and so we, we took those over. It culminated, as I say, in a performance at the monument and, and involved going to lots of different places in the landscape. Our aim was really to try and take insights from various traditions, various cultures around from an archaeological perspective, but from an ethnographic and anthropological perspective as well, to create this kind of immersive experience. And you see on the right hand 
side there, um, a Zimbabwean musician who's playing an imbira, which in fact he made himself, um, sitting on a stone in his traditional outfit. And he talked to us about the meaning of stone in his cultures. And he played us the songs of stone with his imbira. And he led us into another world, a different world, a completely different world to where we are here in Britain. And, and it's incredibly powerful uh, to do this. What we're trying to do, in a sense, is to reach through time to other humans whose traces we know, of course, are illustrated by the archaeology. We use prehistorians and curators of the museums and musicians and all sorts of other people. But we were trying always to draw, draw on inspiration from the terrain, the landscape, if you like, the monuments, of course, very important. But what about the weather, the soundscapes that were around us, everything that we could use in that landscape? We tried to bring to bear on what was going on. And that, in a sense, was the core of the, of the um, sessions which were performed there. An important part of the research, though, is, of course, to know whether it works. And this is very difficult to know. So we have to monitor this kind of thing very carefully. We also have to recognize that we are only part of a person's life during the course of the 10 weeks that they're on the program and, indeed, the life which they're going to lead after the program. So we've got to be very careful that we don't make overblown claims that what we're doing suddenly changes people's lives. I'm not claiming that at all. What we're going to be able to claim is that we make a contribution to how people can fulfill their lives. Well, the research uh, for this was um, coordinated by Vanessa Heaslip at Bournemouth University. She's a, a nurse by training, but uh, works in our Department of Health and Social Sciences and works with marginalized communities, particularly gypsies and Roma travelers and, and groups such as that. Um, and we had the central question, a very simple question, does the creative exploration of the historic environment achieve sustained, measurable mental health and well-being outcomes for people with mental health conditions? Simple question. What we tried to do was address it using quantitative methods, that is, recording people's opinions and states of mind in a systematic kind of way, which would give us some numbers, and also in a qualitative way, in terms of their appreciation and understanding of how the program was unfolding and what it meant to them. We used uh, a series of standard measures. You won't be surprised to know that uh, within uh, healthcare and within well-being studies and within the mental health professional world, there are a series of uh, dedicated measures, and the standard one, which is widely used, is the so-called Warwick-Edinburgh measure of mental health well-being. It's a scale. You answer questions on a kind of, uh, you know, one to five kind of grading, and, and you use those to prepare some numbers beyond it. We collect information, and we put it all together, and of course, there's a baseline study, and then we monitor them during the course of the program, and then we go for a year after the program to see how they've progressed out into the world beyond. It was entirely voluntary to be part of the monitoring. Uh, one or two participants decided they didn't want to be part of the monitoring, which was fine. Um, they were also free to step outside the monitoring if they wished to during the course of the, element, uh, during the, course of the program. And, and I don't think anyone did that, but it was certainly an option that they could have chosen. What we're looking at is a kind of longitudinal um, analysis of people's lives, people's behaviours, people's well-being. And for this project, we were able to do it over, eight, uh, over 15 months. But we do, we would like to do it for longer in due course if, if we can. Um, you can see there on the table below uh, just a very quick breakdown of the kind of age range and the male-female breakdown of the participants in our um, human hinge in the three iterations there. It's a demographic we had no control over. Um, it, the people were given to us by referrals through the NHS system, so we, we didn't choose that population, but it's, it's an interesting one, and small, but representative of quite a wide spread of people. Let's just have a quick look at some of the um, qualitative findings, the numbers, as it were. I don't want to dazzle you with, with science and numbers, especially not this time in the afternoon. Um, but you can see perhaps what's going on here we have uh, a baseline, a midpoint, end of project, and then one year post-project. And these numbers are percentages in brackets. Um, and we ask questions. So this is all about feeling optimistic about the future. So are you optimistic about the future? You could ask yourselves that question right now. 
are you optimistic about the future? And you could grade yourself on the Warwick Edinburgh scale. None of the time, or very rarely, some of the time I'm optimistic, often or all the time I'm optimistic, and there's a few at the bottom who didn't reply to the questionnaire, but, but three um, states in this case. I'm not going to ask you to hold your hands up for which of those you feel that you're in at the moment, but um, you can monitor yourself using these kind of things, and it is actually quite, quite interesting. Um, we're not going to dissect the numbers in my new detail, but we would just point out that the numbers down here, none of the time, question, I, do I feel optimistic? No, I don't, none of the time, 45%. Um, By the end of the project, do I feel optimistic? None of the time, 17%. Quite a decent fall in the way that people think about their world. And you can, you can look at the other passages. I've picked them out to help you uh, on this um, chart. So we've got baseline, middle point, end point, one year post program. These are three, three of the questions. We ask quite a lot of questions, but these are three of them. Feeling optimistic about the future is the one we just looked at. Um, feeling relaxed and feeling close to people. These were gradients that we looked at. And as you can see, they all rose quite considerably. The baseline is down here. People were in a, in a rather uh, difficult position. Well, that's why they're on the project, so that's not surprising. Um, but by the end of the program, they were quite elated. And this uh, group three, uh, sorry, this feeling close to people, very good indeed. Um, that's typical of what happens at the end of the program. It's a bit like the end of the conference on tomorrow night. Everybody's buoyed up and, you know, very happy about it and good. As time goes by, you maybe get a little bit more sceptical of things and perhaps ask a few questions. And in this case with mental health, it does start to fall back a bit. But the really important number is that this, a year after, is considerably higher than this at the start. Now, as I said before, I'm not claiming that our project got everybody from that place to the other place, but I think we may have contributed. I hope we contributed. It did vary a little bit between um, iterations. I mean, we were, this is experimental stuff. Nobody's really done this before. So our first iteration, which is group one on here, which is the blue line on the graph, things didn't go quite as well as they could have done. Um, the red one, let's be absolutely honest, rather better. And by the third time we tried it, I think we got it about right. Um, so there was some experimental stuff there going on. If you like to play with statistics, there's some, um, there's some statistics at the bottom there you can play with. You can see. But counting things is just one dimension. In a way, hearing what people say is much more important in terms of an understanding of what's going on and what's been achieved. And so the qualitative work here is really, really important. I'm just going to show you first a few slides to illustrate the kind of creative activities that we set about in order to try and gauge people's qualitative approaches to what's going on. Now, bear in mind, these people are not necessarily neurotypical. So we have to, first of all, leave that idea of neurotypical at the door. We're going into a world in which people have got all sorts of perspectives, all sorts of takes, all sorts of intelligences, and we need to be able to somehow draw those out. So no one scheme is going to draw out those kind of thoughts from everybody. We need to offer different approaches to being able to communicate your feelings, your emotions, and what's going on. So one of the activities that we used was drawing, to sketch things to show us, a, if you like, a diagram of how you're feeling. And there's a few on the screen there. Bright sunshine's good. Rainbow's good. The heart with Stonehenge in the middle, I find particularly moving. This one down here. There's some interesting themes there. And people, are, not me, but people who are experienced in reading this kind of evidence can get a lot out of this. And there's, there's plenty of um, skill in that in, in the world of, of healthcare studies these days. Um, writing is an important part of it as well, asking people to write about their experiences, a kind of a diary. Um, that was very much part of what we did. So a whole series of creative activities on top of doing the program, ask them in a sense to look into themselves and to express through these various tools what they were thinking, what they were feeling. You won't be able to read the detail of that. It's just to illustrate uh, what's going on. And sometimes you can combine the two. And we found lots of pictures of Stonehenge popping up in amongst the writing and the comments and the text that they were providing. That was one set of, of work. We also used the old trick of um, 
the little yellow post-it notes, or green or whatever colour they were, um, and ask people just to write their thoughts on it, like now. Just write three words, two lines, whatever, and stick it on the board. Let's see. So it's another way of doing things. And I'm going to show you just a short sequence of slides which are based on those post-it notes. And I'm not going to say anything over the top of them. I'm just going to show you them as images, personal reflections by the participants in relation to what they were doing as the programs unfolded. I'm just going to say one thing about the first one. Um, well, you can see the text there. The text is the, the italic kind of script, embracing ancient souls of land, stone, and nature, finding ourselves and each other. Can everyone read that? Because there's going to be some more in a minute. Can everyone read it, or do I need to read them out? Hand at the back, can you see that? Yes? Okay, so in that case, I'm, I'm going to leave these in silence for you to read them, because some of them are incredibly powerful. But I would just preface it by saying the picture here um, on the right-hand side by Donna Songhurst. Donna was one of the participants. She's happy for her name to be associated with this. Um, found that she had this incredible sketching ability. And whilst walking around the monuments, and you can recognise what this one is, I hope, it's Avebury, she sketched the monuments. It's like those people who sit in courtrooms, you know, and sketch the, the defendants and the prosecution and all that sort of stuff, and they do it in a matter of minutes. She had this ability. Incredible. You can capture this image, and she was onto paper, and you'll see a couple more um, as we go through. But we used, we used them in a publication that I'll come to in just a moment. OK, the next few slides I'm not going to put a commentary on. Read what it says, look at the images, and feel what these people were experiencing as they went on the project. I hope you get an impression of the sorts of thoughts which were going through the minds of those people when they were talking to us about what they'd experienced. I should just say, you may have wondered who Max was as we went along there. Max is one of the musicians who came in. He was, in fact, the person playing the bone flutes beside the Avebury stone, and, and he was an important part of that particular performance. 
when we draw these things together, we can tease out a number of things, which is why this program works. The first is the notion of being connected. It's the bridges, which I talked about earlier on. It's reconnecting people with place, with lost possessions, with their own existence, with their own way of being in the world. And a follow-on from that is the idea of being me. The participants found it difficult living in society with their particular mental illnesses, mental conditions that they had. They felt judged and discriminated against and responded to this by isolating themselves and acting in certain ways when out and about in the community. In contrast, in the program, they expressed themselves as being able to be themselves, to be not judged, to be equal in the way that the thing unfolded. And so that became an interesting dimension. Challenging oneself is, of course, one of the ways which many, many areas of, of mental health and um, well-being use, or it's a technique that many, many of these um, programs use in order to help people, because through associating with others with similar experiences, you can develop a strength and a confidence. The confidence to step outside the boundaries that you have set yourself, and it's that kind of dark room effect which we spoke about earlier, which often has been built up to us, it might seem irrational, but it's completely rational to the people concerned. And part of the trick then is to try something new, to stand in a different place, to look at it from a different perspective, to open those doors, open those windows, and let some light in to what's going on. So these things created a much better insight into their own mental health, into their own mental well-being, into their own existence in many senses. And perhaps the crucial word here at the end is, is confidence confidence to manage their own challenges. People who hadn't been out of their own house for years by the end of the project were getting on the bus and coming down to the project. So this kind of confidence is, is just hugely important. We've been promoting this project ever since. Um, we took it out for a series of exhibitions um, around central Wiltshire, Amesbury and, and that sort of area, uh, up at um, Marlborough as well. And uh, we've had some conference participations and we've created some work groups and so on. And we published a book which is based on um, the first project. It's here, it's available through Archeopress and it's free to download. It's an open access publication. You can see the URL at the bottom there. If you go there, you can download the whole thing as a PDF for free. You can buy a copy too if you wish, of course, but um, you can go to it for free. So Historic, Monument, Historic Landscapes and Mental Wellbeing is a collection of, I think, about 25 papers about the project and about other projects which are going on at the same time. It's an important area. It's a developing area. It's an area which archaeology and heritage and culture in general has got to move into. We've all got people we know, if not ourselves, in this situation. We need to be using archaeology and heritage and culture to help those people. And we need to be using our monuments to make those expenses and to make the monuments worthwhile and significant and important in our present lives. I'm pleased to say that earlier this week we started the next iteration with a program called Scaling Up Human Henge. It's um, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. It's a year-long project. We shall be bringing together a series of workshops and roundtables, and in due course next um, January there'll be a symposium uh, about this as well. We're looking at how we can create something which is viable. I must admit the Human Henge project was quite expensive, very expensive for the end of per participant, but it was an experiment. Um, we've got to create something which is viable based on social prescribing, which can be used in a whole range of situations. This is what we want to strive towards, and I hope by the end of it that we'll be able to have not quite a blueprint, but at least a guide to how we can create these kind of experiences around our ancient monuments, around the places like Stonehenge and Avebury and so many others, so that we can do good in the world, and we can hit that number three goal in a world stage, archaeology is contributing to good health and well-being around the world, and that's, that's ultimately our goal. I hope that gives you a picture of what we've been up to and why we've been up to it and what we've achieved. Um, thank you for listening. I'll be around a little bit now, and I'll be around again tomorrow um, if there's questions or points that you'd like to raise. So thanks for listening. <laughs>